Well, thank you for joining me online again. And uh, this is a message I want to share with you, uh, a follow-up uh, to our celebration of Christ's resurrection last week. And uh, uh, all I would have pointed, pointed out to you then and want to remind you again, if we look at God's calendar, the, the holiday is actually called Passover. And it's the actual uh, uh, times that Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. And I've got a little chart here that I found online. I really like it. It covers the uh, main uh, uh, seven uh, feasts that God's word. And, you know, let me point this out. We were told in the Old Testament to celebrate these feasts forever, continually, and even in the New Testament, we are instructed to celebrate them by the Spirit, rather than some, some uh, procedure that we follow under the law, and that's what we want to be careful with. There's a spiritual revelation, there's a reason that God wants us to, to celebrate these every year, and there's a very specific a uh, place God wants to lead us to, especially when we celebrate these in order. So we're going to have a look. I'm going to remind you of some things about uh, a few of these feasts because we've talked about them every year. And then the Feast of Weeks that we're really going to focus on this time. Uh, I've not said that much about it, but I believe there's a revelation that's really going to bring us closer to God and help us in our walk with him. So anyway, let's take a look. So we celebrate Passover, but in the middle of that, that's a seven-day celebration. In the middle of it, we celebrate the, fe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and it's listed as Pentecost here. This feast begins on the second day of, the, uh, uh, of Passover, but it continues for seven more weeks, ending on the day of Pentecost, or the Feast of of weeks. And uh, I want to say this again, I've mentioned this thing to you in the, these things to you in the past. Passover speaks of us, of God's people, and it speaks to us of being set free by the blood of the Lamb. Well, that certainly speaks to our salvation. We were saved from Satan's plots against us by our faith in Christ's sacrifice, the blood of the Lamb. Unleavened bread right in the middle of that same celebration, speaks to us of sin being removed from our life, so it never hinders us from our walk with God. It speaks to us of the sanctification process we go through as believers. And the celebration of first fruits, once again, during the week of Passover, we have the celebration of first fruits, and that speaks of our bearing fruit as a lifestyle, bearing fruit that glorifies God. I call that glorification, okay? Each of those, and it, 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 putting it as simply as it can be put, each of those speaks of a fundamental basic aspect of our walk with God. We get saved. We get sin out of the way, and we spend our life bearing fruit that glorifies God. Each of those principles is addressed and revelation is given to us as we celebrate these festivals or feasts every year. Today, we're going to say, well, what's going on with this Feast of Weeks? We could call it the Festival of Pentecost. What's that all about? Well, in the Feast of Weeks or the, the, the festival that begins second day of Passover and ends seven weeks later on, uh, on, on, on the day of Pentecost, we have a, pra well, let, let, let me read you the verse first from Leviticus 23 and 15, and then we'll, we'll talk about the, the Jewish tradition that was developed in obedience to this instruction. So we read in Leviticus 23 and 15, you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's the first fruit celebration, seven Sabbath shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath 
then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. That new grain offering will be the Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, it'll be the celebration that's called the Feast of Weeks. So it's in the scripture. It's also in Deuteronomy. It's referred to, or it's, it's given several times. What you need to be aware of, God says they should count the days from the beginning of that feast to the celebration of it uh, seven weeks later. And in that, God disciplines his people to count and to pray specific prayers. Now, I'm going to have a, a follow-up to this message next week where we'll look at the prayers uh, and the declaration God gives us to make every day of those uh, of those 50 days, uh, and there's power in that, and there's a release of the spirit, and there's a training uh, of your of your flesh and your soul in that. I just want you to see the scriptural exhortation to celebrate this week for 50, so this uh, to celebrate this festival for 50 days with a very specific start and a very specific end. So anyway, what, what is God's idea from this? Now, this idea here, uh, counting implies a sense of progress and direction. This is from a Jewish website. Uh, this is uh, uh, people who have been counting Omer, it's called, when you every day pray specific prayers and you make a count that says, this is the first day of counting. I'm praying this prayer. I'm making this declaration. This is the second. This is the third. Very traditionally and very religiously, they go through this practice. And remember, I'm not putting you under the law with it, but I'm saying, let's get the spiritual revelation. Let's get the anointing that will come from this understanding. And I believe we'll be empowered to reach some new uh, levels and, and to, to to set and achieve some new goals in our walk with God. So from that Jewish website, counting implies a sense of progress and direction. From the second night of uh, Pesach is the Hebrew word for uh, Passover. We count the Omer, counting off the days for seven weeks until Shavuot, which is the feast of weeks or Pentecost. Counting is an expression of anticipation. Grown-ups count the weeks until the next holiday. Kids count the minutes until the end of class, and so on. I found this uh, little picture to kind of make a point. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We can always use that verse to encourage ourselves to set and pursue goals. I like the big highlight on the word finish there. Now, if nobody was listening to this message today but me, I need it more than anybody I know. I've tended my entire life to get sidetracked from my goals. And I have been challenged by the Holy Spirit. He's been doing things in my life to help me to do better with that. And now that we are in the season of celebrating the Feast of Weeks, it's become apparent to me that the purpose of this is to get us counting days, to be setting goals, and to be applying certain principles every day so that we will set and reach uh, new goals uh, for the purposes of God. So counting, counting of the Omer, counting of the days in the Feast of Weeks is a tool. It's one tool we can use for practical application of this exhortation from uh, Proverbs 13. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When we get sidetracked, it's not good for our soul. But when we set a goal and reach it, it'll be a tree of life for us. Now, this is also from that Jewish website. Counting, counting the Omer, counting the days, it acknowledges where we came from and where we are going. Saying that today is the third day of the Omer requires knowing that yesterday was the second and tomorrow is the fourth. Where we have come from and where we are going towards. Now, 
I have preached on this verse before, and it always speaks to my heart because it challenges us to set goals continually through our lives and as a normal part of our walk with God. So let's have a look at this from 2 Peter. I think it beautifully illustrates the, the principles and the exhortation God wants to give us uh, as we celebrate this Feast of Weeks. 2 Peter 1 and 4. Uh, says that we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Where are we going? Where do we want to set our sights on? Partakers of the divine nature. We want to be like Jesus. 4b, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's where we came from. Remember, Passover speaks of our salvation, which is getting free from the bondage of the enemy so that we can pursue the purposes of God. Verse five, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. That's the discipline of God to add each of these things to our, to our life as a normal part of our walk with God. I use that word discipline because I'm going to make a point about that. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've studied it. Maybe you've uh, 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 used it in your walk with God. I want us to use it more beginning with me. Anyway, verse eight, if these things are yours and abound, you will, will need, be neither barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's where we are going. That's the goal that we want to set for ourselves. Who He who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. That's where we came from. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent Important word there, diligent. I've shared this with you before, characterized by energetic application of effort. That's the definition of diligence. Be diligent to make your call and election sure. If you do these things, you will never stumble. So an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a statement of where we are going. The revelation in the counting of the days from Passover to Pentecost is we know where we came from and we know where we're going. Now, counting the days from Passover to Pentecost teaches us that Passover is connected to and completed by the Feast of Weeks. That's why we are encouraged to celebrate these feasts every year. The exodus from Egypt was not a self-sufficient event. And like I said earlier, exodus from Egypt speaks of our salvation. Our salvation was not a self-sufficient event, but I'm gonna warn you, so many Christians these days, oh, I prayed that prayer, gave my heart to Jesus, asked him to come into my heart and be my savior, and uh, I'm good. That was not a self-sufficient event. It was the first step in a life that would spend the rest of its life moving towards God's promised land. And again, from my, my uh, Hebrew website that I love so much, the exodus from Egypt was a first step towards Sinai, receiving the Torah, that was the written word of God, and becoming a people with a mission. Let that ring in your ears. Our salvation is a first step towards becoming people of God's word, becoming people with a mission, a purpose in God. Listen to this important statement. I have it underlined on your outline there. Freedom without a purpose is merely free to kill time. If we're not moving with purpose, 
inspired by the word of God, led by the spirit of God. If we're not moving, oh, I'm free. I don't have to this. I don't have to that. Freedom without a purpose is merely freedom to kill time. From past over to Pentecost, It's a mission statement. We start with salvation. We move step by step with a purpose, counting the Omer, Seferat Omar, Omer in Hebrew. It's a very, very specific uh, uh, journey with steps, with understanding, with revelation, so that we move effectively, anointed by the Holy Spirit towards fulfilling God's purposes for our life. Now, from the New Testament, gee, and there were so many scriptures I could have used. I just wanted to give you a few to make a point. First Corinthians 9, 24. Uh, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box as in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. First Timothy 4 and 7. Reject profane and old wives' fables Exercise yourself toward godliness. Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. The reason I use these scriptures that tell us to discipline ourselves, we need to train our body to obey exhortations, commandments, instructions that come from the word of God. Uh, and again, I'll be doing a follow-up to this teaching. We're gonna talk about Christian disciplines. I don't know how much you've heard the term. Uh, if you do any kind of research on it at all, uh, you're gonna find out there are 12 Christian disciplines less listed uh, uh, in Hebrew websites, in Christian New Testament websites, listed everywhere. In fact, let me show you the list here of spiritual disciplines, okay? Disciplines of abstinence, solitude, able to spend time by yourself. I'm going to elaborate on these next, next week, uh, but I, I want to just run down the list. Silence, boy, tricky for me to learn to be quiet when I need to. Fasting, honoring God's Sabbath day. Secrecy. Now, in case you're worried about what that means, I have things in my relationship with God that are between me and him. That's, that's having an intimacy with God that you don't share with the rest of the world because it's between you and God. Submission. That means you're submitted to the Holy Spirit. Disciplines of engagement. That's with other people. Can be done corporately, can be done alone, but Bible reading, Bible study, worship, prayer, soul friendship, that's relationships with Christian people who encourage you in the things of God. Personal reflection, soul searching to make sure your walk with God is what and where it's supposed to be. Service, serving other people, ministry to others. Again, I will elaborate on these more next week, but I want you to know, this isn't something I just dreamed up for this sermon. These disciplines, spiritual or Christian disciplines, are, are listed the world over as a normal part of the Christian faith, normal part of anyone's walk with God. And a good point, I'll, I'll show you where this point was made. These disciplines are not attitudes that we have. These are things that we do. These are practices that are a part of our life because we have a relationship with God. Now, 
Here's a note for us to end on for today. No one has ever spiritually matured. Doesn't mean you didn't spiritually mature at all. I'm talking about coming to the fullness in Christ that is available because his death on the cross makes us holy. And because the spirit of God lives inside of us, we should come to a level of spiritual maturity that is defined as us providing our part of the ministry of Christ to this world with his attitude, with his love, with his dedication, providing our part in the ministry of Christ to this world. No one has ever spiritually matured without applying themselves to spiritual discipline or disciplines. So I want to set something in motion this week. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. I missed that one on my note. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, all celebrated during the week of Passover. They speak to us of our salvation, getting sin out of the way of our lives so that we're free to bear fruit that glorifies God. The Feast of Weeks is on the book so that for 50 days, we will take a, a moment every day to pray, to think about our walk with God, to set goals. And day of Pentecost, it's still several weeks away. I want to challenge you. I called it the, the uh, Feast of Weeks Challenge. I want to challenge you and myself to set goals for the day of Pentecost, to pursue those Christian disciplines that I need to either apply for the first time or I need to develop a little more fully so that they can bear the fruit that they are designed to, to, to produce in my life. So I challenge you with that challenge. We're starting something and you'll be hearing more from, from me about it in the weeks to come. I'm just believing the Holy Spirit will use this feast, feast of weeks like never before, to take us by the hand, put us on a path with God, anointed by the Holy Spirit to arrive at a new level of relationship with Jesus Christ, a new level of anointing and interaction with the Holy Spirit as he leads us in our walk with God. That's where we're going. Thank you for joining me in this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm so glad they joined me online. I sow this word in the good ground of every heart. Lord, it is my desire that from this point, you will speak to them and you will anoint them with your grace and with your power. So that when the sun comes up to morning, tomorrow morning, they'll be ready to make a commitment to you, to consider you every day, to ask for your help to ask for your wisdom, to ask for your power to lead them and guide them. And that by the time we arrive at this celebration of weeks on the day of Pentecost, we will truly be anointed and empowered by God for the new things you have for us. Father, I speak that over my brothers and sisters. I pray that for them in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, thank you again for joining me online and we'll see you soon.